AC adapters are everywhere. They provide the DC power that our modern gadgets require and keep those gadgets small by taking up wall space instead. They're often configured for the specific needs of the device they ship with, so they come in a wide variety of different connectors, voltages, and current capacities. If you look closely at the fine print on adapters and devices, sometimes you'll find some interchangeability, and many of us keep around old ones just in case we might need it one day. This video takes that idea one step further and modifies an AC adapter for a different voltage and different connector. In my case, I needed one to charge a Roomba robotic vacuum that I found laying in an e-waste bin. I brought the discarded Roomba home and swapped in a battery from another one that has dutifully swept my floor for nearly a decade. The rescue Roomba fired right up, so I ordered a new battery and tore it down for a thorough cleaning. The bad news was that the special dock charger wasn't with it, but the good news was that it could also be charged through a fairly standard port on the side. Like most devices, the Roomba's power requirements were printed right on it. Maximum of 22 volts and 1.25 amp draw. I had an adapter that could provide more than enough current, but at 24 volts. Just 2 volts above the limit, it may have worked as is, but the last thing I wanted to do was fry the rescue Roomba and have to send it right back to the dump, so I decided to try and modify the adapter's voltage limit. These days, most AC adapters use a common design called a switch mode power supply, or an SMPS. The board is split into the hot AC side and the cold DC side, with isolation between them for safety. The cold side will usually have fewer and smaller components, the most prominent being a chip that tells the hot side how often to switch power on and off, thereby regulating the power output. So the next step was to focus on the cold side and identify this regulator IC. I found only one IC on the cold side and that's typical. The text printed on the IC was TEA1761. So I searched for that in hopes of finding a data sheet. I was fortunate to find two and they had all the information I needed between them. Data sheets can be overwhelming to look at, especially for someone like myself who is not a trained electrical engineer. What has worked for me is to focus first on the things that are familiar, and try and remember that the datasheet contains everything needed to design something brand new, whereas I only need clues about something that's already been built. The first place I looked in the datasheet was the functional description. Most datasheets have something similar, and it's the place to find the simplest, most straightforward description of what the component is designed to do. In this case, it confirmed that the TEA1761 contains the voltage reference and amplifiers to regulate and control the output voltage and current of the power supply, so I knew I was on the right track. Next, I looked at the pinout diagram to find out which pin is responsible for sensing voltage. I quickly found the vSense pin on the diagram, but in order to identify that pin on the IC, I first had to determine the IC orientation on the board. The vertical bar shown in the datasheet means the same thing as the dot in the corner of the actual IC. They both tell you the edge to start counting pins from. I double checked the orientation by reading ohms between the pin that I thought was ground and another known ground on the board. When I read near zero ohms, I knew that I had the orientation right. Now looking back at the data sheet, I could see vSense is pin 6, and I could confidently identify that pin on the board. The next helpful information I found was this example circuit for the TEA1761 IC in a 90 watt adapter. These application notes or application schematics are really common, and assuming the designers didn't stray too far away, they can help to identify surrounding components on the board you're working on. This one visually showed that the vSense pin connects to vOut and ground through resistors. This arrangement is called a voltage divider, and vSense is in the middle of the voltage divider. So now we needed to look at my board to find those corresponding resistors between vSense and vOut, and between vSense and ground. I used the ohm function on my multimeter to figure out which components connect to which other components, and I literally drew a map as I went along. I started with one probe on the vSense pin, and read ohms to other nearby solder pads. When I saw anything under one ohm, I considered that a direct connection and added it to my map. I worked my way from vSense to ground, and then from vSense to vOut. The path from vSense to ground went through a single resistor, noted here in blue, but interestingly, the path from vSense to vOut went through a pair of resistors in parallel, noted here in the pink box. So that had me scratching my head for a bit, but the reason for it became clear as I started examining the values of the resistors. These can be determined from the codes printed on them. There are plenty of videos that explain how to read the codes, and it's a pretty straightforward system, but I use a website to convert the resistor codes to ohm values. For example, on a four-digit resistor code, the code 1002 means 10 kilo ohms or 10K of resistance. Meanwhile, the code 1003 means 100K. That's the first resistor on this path between vSense and vOut, and now I have to get the value of the second resistor as well, which has the code 6203, and that turns out to be 620K. To find the combined resistance of those two resistors in parallel, I can look up the formula or use an online calculator like this one hosted by DigiKey. 
all I need to do is input the two parallel resistor values of 100 kilo ohms and 620 kilo ohms, and it will output their combined resistance. I'll select kilo ohms for that as well, and total resistance is basically 86 kilo ohms. So now I can map these values back to the voltage divider in the example application schematic. On the vSense to ground side of the divider, I have 10K, and the example calls this resistor R33. That'll be important in a moment. Then on the vSense to V outside, I have 86K, and the example calls this resistor R32, but of course mine is actually made up of 100K and 620K resistors in parallel. Next, I searched the application notes for R32 and R33, and found this section just below on setting output voltage regulation. It plainly shows how the values of R32 and R33 affect output voltage. It also shows an example of solving for R33 based on desired output voltage, but this can turn out a resistor value that isn't commonly available. So instead, I put the formula into Google Sheets so that I could insert resistor values that I actually had on hand and find the combination that got closest to my desired output voltage of 22 volts. You can pause the video to see the cell formulas I used, but in the end, I found a solution by playing around with just one of the R32 resistor values. If I swap out the existing 620K for 330K ohms, then the output voltage changed to about 21.7 volts, which is on the safe side of my target. So now it was time to desolder the old resistor and solder in the new one, which sounds easy, but these are a package size 0805, or only about two millimeters long. I won't make this into a soldering tutorial, but if you're new to surface mount soldering, then I recommend checking out a video from a fellow Colin from Adafruit Industries. He gives a fantastic SMD soldering lesson in about eight minutes. With the new resistor combination in place, I connected my multimeter to the DC outputs and carefully powered up the power supply in my insulated vise. Sure enough, output was now 21.7 volts. It's pretty satisfying when all the data sheets, Google Sheets, math, and head scratching result in a change you can measure in the real world. I put the power supply back in its case, remeasured, and eagerly tested it out on my Roomba. Now here's where I could tell you it worked perfectly and ask you to like and subscribe, but like most projects I take on, this one taught me an unexpected lesson. The Roomba did charge, but not reliably. Sometimes it flashed error lights, sometimes it acted charged before it really was done. So naturally, I used this as an excuse to buy new tools. Connecting through an inline meter showed me that the current climbed up over the 1.25 amps on the Roomba label and kept climbing until the power supply shut down, then repeated this over and over again. I had assumed that the Roomba would only pull 1.25 amps, but it turns out it wanted that regulation to come from the charger. This actually makes sense in hindsight. Roombas started out using nickel metal hydride batteries, which like to be charged at a constant current. So iRobot set up their charger to deliver that constant current and allow the voltage to vary. Meanwhile, I had chosen an AC adapter designed to deliver constant voltage and allow the current to vary up to the point where its current protection kicked in. I facepalmed pretty hard, but had to laugh at myself for taking such a complex route to solve the wrong problem. And that's the lesson for anyone, but especially technical folks. When you're about to jump into a project, take a minute to ask yourself if you really know the problem you're about to try and solve, but know that you can still learn a lot by solving the wrong one. I hope this was helpful, and if it was, consider hitting that like button. But in any case, thanks for watching.